This is Dr. Lawrence Brown with yet another episode of Interfaith Issues. Today, inshallah, we're going to discuss the New Testament. And this is the first section of the New Testament because, quite frankly, we just can't cover it all in one go. I'll start by pointing out something everybody knows, and that is that Christianity is divided into a large number of sects, each one with their own interpretation of the Bible. This is well expressed by William Blake in the Everlasting Gospel, in which he quote, both read the Bible day and night, but thou readest black where I read white. This is the attitude of many Christians, uh, basically that their interpretation of the Bible is correct and everybody else is, is wrong. Islam, of course, has a very different perspective on the Bible. Islam believes that the Word of God is to be found within the New Testament, however, that a great deal of corruption, a great deal of addition, omission, and alteration is also to be found. As a result, it was not godly to leave us with a book of Scripture that contained inconsistency. Rather, what was godly was for our Creator to send a final prophet with a final clarifying revelation. Now, that is a bold claim, and it is a claim that needs to be discussed, and that is what I intend to begin to do today. Uh, that discussion necessarily begins with an analysis of the New Testament, because if the New Testament is pristine, Word of God, no problems with it whatsoever, we have to stop there. On the other hand, if there are problems within the New Testament, if there are contradictions, omissions, additions, variety of corruptions, it makes sense for us to look for a final prophet and a final clarifying revelation. So let's look at that, at that issue. To begin with, what we have to hold in our hands are around 5,700 Greek manuscripts of all or part of the New Testament. It is 5,700 Greek manuscripts. Believe it or not, no two of these manuscripts agree in all of their particulars. Now, there are reasons for that, but before I go into that, I want to back up what I am saying, not with my words, but with the words of respected scholars in the field. Bart D. Ehrman is perhaps the most respected scholar of biblical textual criticism of this time. And his comment is, quote, possibly it is easier to put the matter in comparative terms. There are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament, end quote. In fact, some scholars have estimated the differences in the manuscripts to be as many as 400,000. Now, it is not only Bart D. Ehrman who holds this opinion. Others do as well. What is the reason why there are so many differences between plethora of manuscripts that we have in our hands? Well, everybody can come to their own conclusions. But the scholars conclude that the scribes were untrained, unreliable, many were incompetent, many were illiterate, and some were just frankly dishonest. Now, there is good reason to back up these claims. For example, there has been manuscript tracking where a scribe has copied a sentence correctly, copied a sentence correctly, copied a sentence and made a mistake, and then every time they copy after that, they continue to copy the mistake, making it clear that they were copying letter for letter, not word for word, meaning that when they introduced a mistake, when they copied it the next time, they continued to copy the mistake. 
In other words, they could not understand what they were copying. Even when they misspelled a word, they would then continue to misspell it from that point instead of correcting their mistake the next time they copied it. So there is good evidence to support the fact that some scribes really were not up to the task with which they were entrusted. In the words of Metzger and Ehrman, quote, since most, if not all, of the scribes, of them, the scribes, would have been amateurs in the art of copying, a relatively large number of mistakes, no doubt, crept into their texts as they reproduced them. Now, worse yet, some scribes suffered from doctrinal uh, prejudice. They had particular doctrines in their minds, and they worked those into the manuscripts as they copied them. Ehrman states, quote, the scribes who copied the texts changed them, end quote. More specifically, quote, the number of deliberate alterations made in the interest of doctrine is difficult to assess. And I would add that, again, this is not the opinion of one scholar. This is the opinion of many scholars. In fact, entire books of the Bible were forged. We have to remember the Bible is not one book. The Bible is a collection of books. Each gospel, each epistle is regarded as its own book. The Bible that most people read is a collection of 27 books. Out of those, a whopping 9 out of 27 are either forged or highly suspect. Which 9? Ephesians, Colossians, 2 Thess uh, Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, 1 and 2 Peter, and Jude. 9 out of 27. A full one-third of the New Testament books and epistles are to one degree or another either forged or suspect. Now, should we be surprised by this? Mm, not really. Why? Let's look at what we consider or what Christians consider to be the most holy of the scriptures, the Gospels. The Gospels attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Who wrote them? I know they're attributed to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Who wrote them? They're anonymous documents, as any scholar will, will tell you. The Gospels were written anonymously. None of them were signed. None of them declare themselves to have been authored by such and such a person. As Ehrman tells us, quote, most scholars today have abandoned these identifications, the identifications of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Quote, and recognize that the books were written by otherwise unknown, but relatively well-educated German-speaking and writing Christians during the second half of the first century. Graham Stanton affirms, quote, the Gospels, unlike, unlike most Greco-Roman writings, are anonymous, are anonymous. The familiar headings which give the name of an author, the Gospel according to, were not part of the original manuscripts, for they were added only early in the second century. Let's think about this for a minute. This is not a Bible, and I don't want you to pretend that it is. But let's just take this book, and let's say that I came to you with this book, whatever it is, and I told you, you can trust your, your salvation to this book. When you die, you will either go to paradise or to the fire. But you can trust this book to guide your life so that you will be protected from the fire and you will be in paradise for all eternity. Don't worry, the fire will not touch you. And you ask me, okay, well, who wrote it? And I said, uh, I don't know. I'm really not sure. And it doesn't say anywhere who wrote it. And every scholar ever analyzed it agrees that it is an anonymous book, but you can trust your salvation on it. Here, take it, take it, and live your life according to it. Let's admit, what would most people do in that situation? Oh, you expect me to trust this book with my salvation, and we don't even know who wrote it? Ha <laughs> ha! Very funny. 
Um, we have to be serious about this matter. Religion is not a joking matter. If I brought you a book and told you to write a science project on this book, because everything in this book is, is correctly analyzed, every formula is perfect, every conclusion is precise, write a report and present it as a PhD thesis. It would never be accepted because we don't know the reference. We don't know the author. It would not be accepted as a book report in high school. It would not be accepted in grammar school because you're writing something completely unknown. The author could be somebody with a prejudice. He wants to project a certain thought. The author could be somebody who was untrained, was illiterate, was writing stories they heard from somebody else. We have no idea. And yet that is what we are told to do with the Bible, to trust our salvation to four Gospels, which were anonymous. We don't know who wrote them. We don't know precisely when they were written. And we don't know why they were written. And in addition, to trust nine out of 27 books, which are now known to either be forged or highly suspect. Again, trust your salvation to it? I doubt it very much. But that's what we have. Let's remember, Mark was a secretary to Peter, Luke a companion to Paul. In Luke and Matthew, there are lists which enumerate the names of the disciples. Neither Mark nor Luke are on them, so they were not disciples. Even if they had authored the books, even if they had authored the Gospels, they were not disciples to begin with. Stanton poses an interesting question. Quote, was the eventual decision to accept Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John correct? Today it is generally agreed that neither Matthew nor John was written by an apostle, and Luke may not have been associates of the apostles. Who were they? Who were the authors? We don't know. Who were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John anyway? Not apostles and not associates of apostles. Professor Ehrman is even more direct in his analysis. Quote, critical scholars are fairly united today in thinking that Matthew did not write the first gospel or John the fourth, that Peter did not write two Peter and possibly not one Peter. No other book of the New Testament claims to be written by one of Jesus's earthly disciples. There are books by the apostle of Paul, of course. 13 go by his name in the New Testament, at least seven of which are accepted by nearly all scholars as authentic. Read between the lines. He's saying seven out of 13 are accepted as authentic. What does that mean about the other six? Seven are accepted as authentic. Six, roughly half, are not. Again, we reach this point where I would like to continue, but we need to take a, a short break. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. Dr. Lawrence Brown speaking about the New Testament on interfaith issues. We will pick up where we left off. So why then do our, our Bibles attribute the Gospels to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Each person has to come up with their own answer to that. But the common conclusion is that they had to be attributed to somebody. Might as well attribute them to somebody who would lend some aura of respectability to the work. Origen, the third century church father, was quoted as having written, the differences among the manuscripts have become great, either through the negligence of some copyists or through the perverse audacity of others. They either neglect to check over what they have transcribed or in the process of checking, they make additions or deletions as they please. And that is what we are left with in the New Testament today. When we look at the Bible and we look at Christianity, the outside observer has one question that they tend to ask before any other. And that is that if Christians believe that God is one, why do they also profess the Trinity? The knee-jerk answer is the the uh, first epistle of John 5, 7 through 8. 
This is where you find reference to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. What's the problem with this? The problem with this is that the Johannine comma, this passage, is now well recognized as an interpolation, a misleading insertion. It is not to be found in the original scriptures. It is, according to the authorities, to be cast out, and so it has been. If you read more modern versions of the New Testament, the results of more scholarly analysis, such as the New International Version and the New Revised Standard Version, you find that this verse has been altered to reflect the true meaning. And this does not include the substantiation for the Trinity. There are other problems. There are many verses of the New Testament that are so uncertain that they are actually even left blank. If we read Acts 8.37, we have one problem. Acts 8.37, look it up, try to read it. You can't, you can't read it. Why? Because it's empty, it's not there. They enumerate it, you'll have Acts 8.36 and then Acts 8.37 and then Acts 8.38, but Acts 8.37 is left blank. They don't know what it supposedly said, if it ever said anything at all. And that is not a lone example. There are many others. Matthew 17, 21, 18, 11, Mark 7, 16, 9, 44, 9, 46, parts of Luke 9, 56, 17, 36. It goes on. These are all verses which are either enumerated and left blank or in which significant portions have been cut out. Why? Because the content are unknown. The point we have arrived at is a point in which, because of greater scholastic analysis, because of greater achievements among not the critics of Christianity, but among Christian scholars, are recognizing that the Bible does not stand up to the criteria necessary to call it unaltered, inerrant, divine scripture. It is very much altered. It is very much corrupted. Omissions, additions, alterations, doctrinal prejudice. Unfortunately, these are not my conclusions. These are the conclusions of Christian scholars. We have to respect that. A person who claims to be Christian is claiming to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. They're claiming to be a person of God. They're claiming to be sincere. But if you are sincere, you will be looking for the inerrant word of God, wherever you find it, whether to your liking or not. And for that, we have to look beyond the New Testament. The New Testament, as I said, the Islamic viewpoint is, it does contain the Word of God. There are portions that contain the Word of God. But there are so many uncertainties regarding the content that identifying which portions those are, knowing with certainty what tenets of faith described by the Church are true and what are not, cannot be done with a book of Scripture that is of such uncertain foundation. As I said, this is a talk that has to be done in several parts. It is easy to jump to a conclusion like what I have just said. Those who honor the scholars, those who honor the evidence, will agree. Those who want to just shut their eyes and close their ears and just say, oh, make it go away, make it go away, I don't want to know, Okay? It's not convenient to be a righteous person. It is not easy to be a righteous person. I don't want to go down that path of having to be serious and actually pursuing the religion of truth. Well, as you wish. But for those of you out there who seriously want to entertain the issues, embrace the evidence. In the New Testament, there are a lot of inconsistencies that you can see with your own eyes. Within my books, I enumerate these. You can go to my website, leveltruth.com, L-E-V-E-L-T-R-U-T-H.com, and you can read more about these in my articles, in my books, 
you can explore the unpublished chapters. I'm going to give you a little taste for it right now. Matthew 2.14 and Luke 2.39. In one case, Jesus' family was described as fleeing to Egypt. In the other, to Nazareth. Which one? Matthew 4, 3 through 9, and Luke 4, 3 through 11, disagree on the order in which Jesus allegedly was told by Satan to do things. Matthew 6, 9 through 13, Luke 11, 2 through 4, these describe the Lord's Prayer. The Jesus Seminar, a group of 300 Christian scholars, have agreed that these two versions do not agree the wording is not the same, and these 300 scholars have agreed that the only word in the Lord's Prayer, the most famous Christian prayer, that can be reliably said to be traced to Jesus Christ is the word Father. Matthew 8, 5, Luke 7, 3. The story of the centurion who allegedly came to Jesus Christ. In one story, he came himself. In another, he sent messengers. Matthew 9.18, Mark 5.22. These stories describe a man, a ruler, who came to Jesus speaking of his daughter, who in one gospel just died, in another gospel has not died, but is at the point of death. You can't have it both ways. Death is a fairly certain thing. Either you're dead or not. Matthew 11, 13, and 17, 11. John 1, 21. In one gospel, John the Baptist was Elijah. In the other gospel, he was not. This is a major, major contradiction. Now this list goes on and on and on and on and on. And we don't have time for it. We have time for those who are interested to go to the website to read the books, to read the articles. All I have time to do now is to give you a taste and to appeal to you. Those of you out there who consider yourselves to be people of God, to be people of the prophets, to be sincere, embrace the evidence I have just presented. Please, not for me. It does nothing for me, but for yourselves. Ask God for guidance. Pray with sincerity for him to reveal the religion of truth to you and to place you thereupon. And until next time, this is Dr. Lawrence Brown concluding this episode of Interfaith Issues, wishing you peace and hoping to see you next time. I feel the peace, I feel the peace inside of me, inside of me. a complete tranquility. I remember Allah, He remembers me, feel the peace, feel the breeze, fresh, pure, holy peace, peace in you, peace in me, peace for everybody, fresh, pure,